Did you know that the average SaaS startup spends $116,000 a year on the cloud? This makes sense since for less than the price of one employee's salary, you can have a scalable application that is simple and cheap. Amazing. Every word of what you just said was wrong. Except something's wrong. It's actually a million hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year. And for that, you get a service that still recommends a certification so that you can learn how to use it properly. How do we live in a world where we have subject matter experts for setting up AWS? Isn't the whole point of paying for the cloud that it's supposed to be painless? Using this information, I've come up with this elaborate graph explaining how Jeff Bezos became the world's richest man. As you can see, Venture capitalists give all their money to startups and startups give all their money to AWS. Simple. ECR, ECS, RDS, ALB, CloudWatch, Lambda, S3, and even GitHub Actions. In a lot of cases, you can achieve very similar results with nothing more than Linux, Git, Docker, and a few other open source tools. In this video, we're going to deploy a website for the cost of a domain name. We're going to deploy a server, a database, analytics, all with HTTPS, zero downtime deployments, and continuous delivery. We will be using simple and boring tools that you probably already have installed on your computer. And I also want to discuss common opinions on self-hosting and why I think we've become too dependent on cloud providers without good reason. Obviously, I'm not saying that everyone should always self-host everything, but I'm advocating for always using the simplest tool to solve the problem you actually have. There is no one-size-fits-all solution and anyone telling you so is probably a salesperson. Understanding these simple tools is more valuable, scalable and cheaper than locking yourself into a vendor. The first thing you need is a computer. My weapon of choice is a 2017 entry-level MacBook Pro. I left it charging in a drawer for too long and the battery swelled up. So I ripped it out, breaking the keyboard in the process, and now have the equivalent of a desktop computer but with a screen and terrible thermal performance. You can and should use an actual computer, but this is a good example of how easy it can be to get started. Assuming you're not a masochist, you'll want to install Linux. Most of the internet generally recommends Ubuntu or Debian, with people generally saying that Ubuntu is friendlier while Debian is more stable. But every Everyone is wrong. I'm going to use NixOS. It's declarative, repeatable, and has a metric ton of packages. And when I come back to an abandoned project two years later, I can just look at one configuration file to see how the machine was set up. I flashed NixOS on a bootable USB using Belina Etcher and followed the steps to install on my computer's main partition. I would recommend using the GUI installer even for a headless system since it makes the initial configuration so much easier and you can still select headless during the process. The first two things you want to do are connect to the local network and enable SSH. Like all things in Nix, I can do both of these from a single configuration file. While I'm here, I'm also going to install Git, Docker, Tmux, and Vim. I refuse to use Nano more than once per computer. I also want to ensure that the firewall is enabled and only allow connections on port 80 and 443 since this machine will be on the public internet. Now I can stuff this computer in a drawer and use SSH to connect to it from an actual computer with a working keyboard. Elastic Container Service is a fully managed container orchestration service that helps you easily deploy, manage and scale containerized applications. So in other words, ECS is just Docker. Since I've already installed Docker, we can replace all of ECS using just the docker run command. In the cloud, we usually have to build our image and push it to a registry. But here we can just build and run the images locally. To do that though, we're going to need to clone the project onto this computer. So let's create some SSH keys, which I'll add to my GitHub account. I also create a services directory to store my repositories in and clone my project. My project contains a Docker file for my server. This is a two-stage Docker file. The first stage uses a Gradle base image to build my Kotlin project. This could be done outside of Docker, but I do it this way so that I don't need to manage Gradle versions on the host machine. The second stage takes the output from the build stage and runs the executable. Two stage builds allow me to have a smaller runtime image. Let's build this Docker image using Docker build. This takes a few minutes. I'm telling you this computer is begging for death. And then we can run it using Docker Run. I'm going to open up the port that the service runs on so that I can make sure the website is working using my local network. This landing page doesn't really have anything interesting, but this service also contains the HTML to Kotlin DSL tool that I used to write server-side HTML directly in Kotlin. We now have the website working locally, but we want it to be globally available. And preferably, I'd like it not to be flagged as malware. So we're gonna have to implement HTTPS. This is most commonly done using a reverse proxy. A reverse proxy is a separate service that maps requests to different services. For example, we could serve static files or web server depending on the URL path or subdomain. Pointing a reverse proxy to static files is a very simple replacement for file storage. Ideally, your reverse proxy would also handle middleware like caching and HTTPS certificates. The most common tool for this is Nginx. It's battle tested and everywhere and very good, but Nginx does much more than just reverse proxying and I don't need all those features. I also hate having to manually set up HTTPS certificates, so I'm 
going to use caddy instead. Caddy is less common, but it has dead simple syntax for reverse proxying and automatic HTTPS. So it's a perfect fit for what I need. Here's my caddy file for this project. You can see I route everything from the base URL to the main server. And anything that comes through the analytics subdomain, I map to my analytics service, which we'll be setting up later. Since I will be running caddy on the same Docker network as my other services, I can reference the container name directly instead of using manual IP addresses. This will be very helpful when implementing zero downtime deployments later. I could build and run another Docker file for caddy, but since I want everything to be on the same network, I will be using Docker Compose. Docker Compose allows you to build and run multiple Docker images using a single YAML file. This is a good opportunity to show all the containers that I'm running for this service. The first container is my main server. This is the container we manually built and ran before. If I specify the Docker file and context, I can use Docker Compose to both build and run my containers. I could even publish all of them using this exact same file if I wanted to. My main server uses SQLite to persist data. I'll be using a Postgres container for some analytics, but SQLite is the right choice for my server since my application isn't multinodal. More on that later. This configuration lets me run my server using my local Docker file. I don't need to expose any ports for this particular container since it will be accessed by Caddy through the Docker network. The next container is Caddy. I'm using an existing image instead of my own Docker file and providing my Caddy file using a volume in Docker Compose. I expose ports for HTTP and HTTPS since all the requests to the host machine will be going through this container. After this, I have a few containers to run Plausible. Plausible is an open source alternative to Google Analytics that can be self-hosted. To be honest, it's probably a little overkill for my use case, but it gives me a nice UI with secure login, so I'm happy with it for now. The point here is that you can pick and choose from any open source tools to run alongside your main containers and give you additional features. This can range from analytics to databases to telemetry and so on. Plausible is just something that suited my needs. Plausible includes a couple databases, including a Postgres one. I can add as many services as I want to this compose file and build using Docker Compose build. This will create all the necessary images to run my containers. I can then use Docker Compose up to run the whole stack. Logs can be accessed directly through Docker. I use Tmux to scroll through them. And if I need to do some analytics, I can output them and use the normal CLI tools I have like Orc, Grep, and JQ to execute queries. Now that my service is up and running, it is technically accessible, but it won't be available on port 80 or 443 on my local network. This is because Caddy expects the request to be coming from the domain I specified in the Caddy file. I just need to set up DNS on the service I used to purchase my domain name and point it to my server and my website is now accessible. As previously mentioned, this application isn't multinodal. This is because I have no requirement for this to be multinodal. I don't mind if this has short outages and only have one spare computer. This is not a limitation with self-hosting though, and you can host multiple nodes if you have multiple computers. Docker has built-in technologies to go from a single container to multinodal services, some of which we have already covered. If all you need is a single container, you can build and run it using the Docker CLI. This is the first example we showed. If you want to run multiple containers on a single computer, Docker Compose lets you configure that using a single YAML file. This is how I'm choosing to run my services. If you want to run multiple containers across multiple computers, you can use Docker Swarm to communicate between the computers and load balance between them. And if, for some reason, you need more orchestration than that, you can reach for Kubernetes. Obviously, even if you are using Docker Swarm across multiple computers, you will still need a single database. This could be something like a single Postgres instance running on your master node, which is backed up to the other machines, or a dedicated NAS with RAID enabled. This is something I'd like to explore more in the future. Like I mentioned, Docker Compose is well suited for my needs since I am running on a single machine. The only problem is that deployments are not zero downtime. I don't want it to go down every time I have a deployment, especially once we have continuous deployment set up. I used to have another dependency for this, but now I just do it directly with Compose. You can use the scale command to scale up to two containers and then remove the old one, allowing for zero downtime deployments. This works well because, as you remember, Caddy is pointing directly to the service name, so it will automatically route traffic to the new service when the old one becomes unavailable. I just need to run Caddy Reload to make sure that it stays happy across multiple deployments. I've created a simple shell script to automate my deployment steps. It just pulls the latest version from Git, builds the Docker images using Compose, and then scales up to two tasks. I sleep for 30 seconds since it's easier than doing a health check, and then I scale the old container down. 
I have an extra command to ensure that only one server container is running once deployment is finished and another command to reload caddy after every deployment. This will update any changes I made to the caddy file, also with zero downtime. This script is great for manual deployments, but what I want is a cron job that ensures the latest version has always been deployed. If I ran this script every minute, it would never stop deploying. So I have another script called deploy if changed. It's a simple script that fetches the latest upstream and only runs the deploy script if there are any changes between my local and remote, stashing if there are uncommitted local changes. Now I want to run this using a cron job. I create a directory called automation in my home directory. And in here, I create one last shell script. This script will do three things. It will CD into the correct directory using its absolute path. It outputs all the logs to a dedicated file instead of standard output. And it uses a log file to prevent simultaneous deployments from canceling each other. My potato takes a few minutes to run the build, but I want my cron job to run very frequently. I had a few issues where I got into a weird state when deploying multiple times in quick succession. Using a log file will only run the command when no one else is currently accessing the file. Since the changes are only pulled when there is no log file being used, any new changes will wait for the current deployment to be finished before redeploying the next version. The final thing we need to do is create a cron job that executes this script. First, I need to install cron, which I can do by editing my configuration file. You can add a new cron job by running cron tab e, specifying the user. All I want is a job that runs every minute and runs the automation deploy script. I don't use GitHub Actions or any other deployment tools. For a simple repository with a single target, there is little reason to use anything more than a few bash scripts. It's dead simple to maintain because it has very few dependencies and it works really well for what I needed to do. It's also true continuous deployment. Head of main is in production, always. I know this because Git and bash are enforcing it. There are a few common arguments against doing something like this. And while some do hold weight, I want to discuss them and why I tend to disagree. I have two rules that led me down this journey. Avoid premature optimization and avoid unnecessary abstractions. Although the second rule is probably a subset of the first. But I choose to explicitly remind myself to avoid unnecessary abstractions because as software engineers, we are drawn to them. The first argument people tend to have is that the cloud is scalable. I know very few people that genuinely need to scale 10 or 100 times overnight. I certainly don't. And for a few reasons. The first one is that I don't want explosive growth. I don't think it's healthy. I want slow and steady growth with people that stick around. If this particular website did blow up, I prefer it to crash rather than to scale. I would only want it to scale if I'm sure that the traffic was not malicious and I'm sure that my conversion numbers could healthily cover costs. The truth is that getting huge overnight where short downtime would be a deal breaker is not a very common situation and I'm not ready to accept vendor lock-in just to be ready for an event that is very unlikely to happen and has very little negative impact, even if it does. Another thing people will say is that the cloud is easier to get started. I've often found that things that are easier in software tend to be easy because they're an abstraction around something very complicated, while things that tend to be hard are actually simple under the hood. I would much prefer an engine with no cover if it meant that I could tweak it than an engine I don't understand, which probably wasn't even designed for my use case. I agree that in some cases, it's easier to get started started with the cloud, but progress can grind to a halt when you need to do something unexpected or unintended. At the end of the day, you are using a black box designed by someone else. If a black box has no input for what you want to change, or if you are unfamiliar with the abstractions provided, then you're out of luck. I will always choose simple tools over easy ones. Simplicity is hard, but it pays dividends in the long run. The last thing people will say is that the cloud is worldwide. And this is true. If you want to serve dynamic content, meaning content that cannot be cached by CDN, with low latency to multiple regions or directly to a regions you don't have access to, then you need to use the cloud. But I've actually never seen anyone use multiple regions on the clouds for their services. So I don't know how common this actually is. Obviously, there are some cases where the needs of a product are different and the cloud is the best solution. In that case, by all means, use it. I just don't like the idea that because Fortune 500 companies do things a certain way, we should all follow suit. Your product is probably not a Fortune 500 and the chances are it never will be. We've defaulted to doing things a certain way, even when the advocated way is overkill for our actual needs. Cloud providers have convinced many people to accept their marketing material as the absolute truth. Maybe we should take a second to rethink our actual requirements before playing in these walled gardens. I didn't get to go deep into all these topics, some because they just weren't requirements I need right now. If you are looking to do this but need to take it to the next step, I would check out Linux KVM, Docker Swarm, NAS and RAID. These technologies will let you spin up redundant, highly available services. Thank you for taking the time to watch and I hope that you found some of this helpful. I really want to thank everyone for watching all the way to the end. It makes me so unbelievably happy to have people interested in the random rabbit holes I go down.
There's another video to watch here if you're interested. Okay, bye.